monsters. What is it about them? Whether you're stricken with fear or nervously tucking your hair behind your ear at the sight of them, I'm looking, respectfully of course, at you, Lady Dimitrescu. They certainly always make an impact. Monsters have been around for pretty much as long as most of us can remember, and thousands upon thousands of years before that. There's something universal about fear, and yet there's something very particular about it. We aren't afraid of the same things, even from one person to the next, let alone across history and across culture. In our video on neocolonialism, I argued that fear is politically shaped, and in this video I'll be arguing very much the same thing, but digging a little bit deeper. In fact, I became so interested in the idea of monsters in games while researching this topic that you can be sure that this won't be the last you hear from us on it. Whether or not bedtime stories and fairy tale monsters were a staple of your upbringing, if you play video games, you've certainly encountered a virtual monster or two before. Before we ask questions like, okay, what is a monster actually? Let's just take it for granted for a minute that most of these creatures, bulbous, animalistic, maybe even sometimes kind of hot, are usually there for you to kill. Not universally. Sometimes games, like many mediums, want to play around with the idea of what a monster is. Is a monster all surface, or is it something deeper? What if you are not the hero vanquishing the monster, but the monster feeding on its prey? And what exactly have monsters to do with, you guessed it, politics? Don't Nod's Vampire is one of these latter games. It's interested in destabilizing your idea of what makes a monster. It's interested in making you the monster. In using the video game medium, the story impresses upon us that your actions will have consequences. That perhaps it isn't monstrous bodies, but monstrous actions that make a monster. Well, Mary Shelley certainly seemed to think so. But there's something more. In Vampire, you play as Dr. Jonathan Reed, a middle-class white man freshly turned blood-sucking creature of the night. The year is 1919, and the Spanish flu is ravaging the city of London. Your mission is to discover and cure the source of this epidemic, and to find out how and why you became a vampire. As the game progresses, you advance through the quarantined and segregated districts of London, interacting with many people of varying class and racial backgrounds, all with stories to tell. As you progress, the game design is such that generic gameplay actions like defeating enemies in combat and chatting to your colleagues grant basically negligible XP rewards, making it extremely difficult to advance through levels. But kill a civilian, an NPC with a name and a backstory, and you gain a sizable XP boost. Jonathan's moral struggle is meant to be rooted in the tension between his commitment to the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, and his newfound vampiric nature to feed on the lives of others. You, as the player, must navigate this tension. But what if doctors and vampires aren't like angels and devils on Jonathan's shoulder at all? What if they're alike? Bryn Gelbert points to the distribution of healthcare as a prominent theme in Vampire, which he describes as a healthcare management sim. At the core of the game, Gelbert argues, is the question, who deserves care and who deserves death? When I first played Vampire, we were almost two years into the COVID pandemic. Mandatory lockdown had long ended here in the UK, but I'd had a surgery which severely restricted my range of movement for several weeks. I was trapped inside, again. When I picked up Vampire, I couldn't help feel an eerie familiarity. Ghostly streets, people mostly holed up inside unless they absolutely needed to leave or didn't care for the safety of others. Posters upon posters telling people to wear masks, to stay inside, to wash their hands, to cough and sneeze safely. It's uncanny, really. Vampire came out in 2018, before the COVID outbreak, and I had little interest in playing it because, well, you play as a middle-class white man. Reviews hadn't been kind either, so it just slipped off my radar. But I'm really glad I played it when I did, because I'm here to argue that playing Vampire since 2020, and as the COVID pandemic, importantly, continues, is incredibly worthwhile. In Vampire, in a nutshell, you are the power over life and death in the midst of a healthcare crisis which is entrenching class and racial segregation. Sound familiar? Hi, and welcome to Game Assist. I'm Sarah, pronouns they, them, and she, her. 
Before we dive into this video essay, make sure you're subscribed and have the notification bell turned on to find out when we post. If you really like what we do, consider joining our Patreon community. We have rewards from just £1 a month, and it helps us to keep doing what we're doing. Alternatively, if a one-off payment would be better for you, consider buying us a coffee on Coffee. All of our links are in the description below. This video will contain spoilers for Vampyr, obviously, but before we get stuck in, some content warnings. In this video, there will be mentions and depictions of medical abuse, violence, and malpractice. Depictions of blood, gore, needles, self-harm, and physical violence to others. Negative and othering depictions of people with limb and facial differences. Discussions of xenophobia and racism, particularly anti-Semitism and anti-Romanian discrimination. Discussions of disabilism, classism, and queerphobia. And finally, discussions of eugenics. Monsters are a great place to start when thinking about politics in Vampyr, because they are, as Jack Halberstam puts it, meaning machines. So when thinking of the modern vampire, certainly in Western popular culture, we no doubt immediately think of Dracula. Bram Stoker's novel and its film adaptations and spin-offs have played a huge role in shaping our go-to vampire tropes, including the vampire's need to be invited into your home, its aversion to Christianity, its association with money and aristocracy, and more. So what do vampires represent? Or perhaps it's more useful to ask, what have they represented, and what can they represent, and why? Jack Halberstam makes the case that in the 19th century, in novels like Frankenstein, Jekyll and Hyde, Dorian Gray, and Dracula, monsters often served as a receptacle for all that was fearsome, loathsome, and othered in society. All at once, these monsters bear the mark of gender and sexual deviance, of madness, of racial otherness, and they explore questions of surface and depth merely by existing. This has historical and political context, of course. The 19th century saw the rise of modern race science, which still deeply influences our race thinking today, as we've discussed in our settler colonialism video. Race science generated the idea of categorizing humans according to phenotype, physical attributes like nose shape, skin colour, and so on, and that this physical appearance, by marking your race, marked you as human, or something not quite. On this theme, the 19th century period saw the rise of the concept of degeneracy, or degeneration. There's a great ContraPoints video on this which I'll include in the description of this video, but in short, the idea was that humans were degenerating over time, and immoral practices would speed up degeneration. Sexual and gender deviance were degenerate behaviours, or the mark of a degenerate human. Art could be degenerate, and gothic art was often considered so. Most importantly, degeneration was meant to explain why humans looked different. So, in other words, if you weren't white, this was a mark of biological degeneration and the decline of civilization as a whole. Degeneration was also seen to cause pathological madness, evil, and criminality. The concept is queerphobic, disabilist, and racist all at once. It justified eugenicist attitudes towards these groups. The idea was that allowing degenerates to breed would further the degeneration of the race, and this was core to the 19th century concept of a monster. Degeneration was visible through racial features, which often characterized the mad, sexually depraved monster. But sometimes a degenerate might lurk behind a beautiful surface, like Dorian Gray or the monstrous Hyde within the respectable Jekyll. Dorian's portrait and Jekyll's alter ego bear the marks of visible degeneracy and monstrosity, but their appearance is as the poster boy of the superior white middle-class race. Alright, so what about vampires? Nowadays, we might be likely to conjure an image of perfect beauty, like the sparkling white Cullens, if you're into that kind of thing. But our most famous 19th century vampire text had a very different take. Jack Halberstam argues that in Bram Stoker's novel, Dracula is otherness itself. He's effeminate, he's homosexual, he's foreign, he's mad, and he's Jewish. Dracula, according to Halberstam, resembles the Jew of anti-Semitic discourse in several ways. His appearance, his relation to money and gold, his parasitism, his degeneracy, his impermanence or lack of allegiance to a fatherland, and his femininity. Dracula represents fears about race, class, gender, sexuality, and empire. An all-purpose monster. 
The vampire, at its core, is a parasite. The image of the parasite has been mobilised to produce anti-Semitic ideas of diseased, bloodthirsty, money-hungry Jews who leech on the English, corrupt pure English women, spread disease through blood, and lurk in the shadows from where they rule the world. It's Christian imagery, the one true faith, of course, which repels vampires, but notably not other religious imagery. I don't think Stoker's vampires would start at the sight of my Quran, for example. In fact, Bela Lugosi's Dracula from the 1931 film wears a necklace which strongly resembles a Star of David. In 1987, General Mills even released a box for their serial Count Chocula which explicitly depicted Lugosi's Dracula wearing a Star of David. Yikes. Dracula is, of course, not just a heathen, but a foreigner, from Transylvania specifically, subtly invading our English borders. Vampires, like the racist foreigner, feed upon you only if invited into your home. Then there's the emphasis on blood. As Halberstam puts it, blood, in the Gothic, signifies race as well as sex, gender as well as class, and to have blood on your hands is to be implicated in the blurring of essential boundaries of identity. So the 1800s offer centuries-old European anti-Semitic tropes with a modern twist. Jewish Dracula is pathologically evil and mad, monstrous precisely because of his femininity, his bisexuality, his foreignness. The mark of his monstrosity is upon his body, in his racial features like his hooked nose and his hairy appendages. Halberstam argues that such depictions of quote-unquote ugly monsters, which are clearly racialized, have gone out of vogue. Maybe this is somewhat true, though I would argue not entirely, so newer adaptations of Dracula and other vampire stories might be more interested in beautiful, charming, even sympathetic Transylvanian counts. Monstrosity isn't so simple, it can't be contained in a single image. If monsters have represented all that is socially and politically peripheral to society, they have often been vanquished, slain, or purged by the end of these stories. All of this begins to reveal why queer people, in particular, have felt so enamoured with the figure of the vampire. Among other things, it represents us, and many storytellers have subverted or revitalised the queerphobic image to tell queer stories. Notable are several adaptations of Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla, which actually predates Bram Stoker's novel by about 20 years. Newer depictions of Carmilla morph the novel's original monstrous, predatory, blood-sucking lesbian and turn her into a figure of sympathy. A 2019 adaptation, for example, spins it into a tale of religious guilt, lesbophobic violence, and lesbian resistance and longevity. Which brings us, just about, to Vampyr. Dracula, and many vampires since, are often rich fucking bastards. In Dracula's case, as we've discussed, this has a lot to do with his characterization through the anti-Semitic trope of the greedy, money-hoarding Jew. But one of the most notable early examples of vampiric imagery deployed to critique capitalism rather than promote anti-Semitism came from Karl Marx, who wrote in the First International that British industry, vampire-like, could but live by sucking blood, and children's blood too. For Marx, the vampire doesn't symbolise the other, but the system which creates and oppresses the other. A couple of recent films play with this idea too. Vampires vs. the Bronx is a teen movie with a thoughtful premise. The vampires are the white people that operate Murnau Properties, a real estate developer gentrifying the Bronx and pricing racialized people out of their own neighbourhood. While our blood-sucking villains call our racialized protagonists vermin, the vampire metaphor pushes us to think of gentrification as the real parasitic practice. By associating gentrification with centuries-old white immortals, it becomes the inevitable result of a colonial capitalist system long in the making. Meanwhile, the absolutely memed to shit but genuinely brilliant Vampire's Kiss, starring the one and only Nick Cage, tells the story of an insufferable literary company executive who both systematically harasses the young racialized woman who works as his assistant, and imagines another young racialized woman sucking his blood every night and turning him into a vampire. Peter, that's Nick Cage's character, imagines women of colour through misogynistic and racial tropes as hypersexual and parasitic, but in reality, he's the one that's violent and abusive towards women of colour. He has the power. He's the real vampire. Well, metaphorically, not literally. What he literally is, is a pathetic, lonely man in plastic costume shop vampire teeth. 
So what about games? I'm about to explore themes of power, including race, class, and disability in a particular vampire game, but it isn't the only one to take these topics on. Harvey Smith, creator of Redfall, says the thematics are that the richest 0.1% are already vampires, and in this game, they literally become vampires. There's the popular franchise Vampire the Masquerade too, which offers a lot of food for thought in a world of rich, detailed vampire lore. But let's save that one for another video. So what about vampires? Well, vampires. Dr. Jonathan Reed, his name invoking Jonathan Harker and even Dr. John Seward from Bram Stoker's Dracula, certainly isn't a totalizing monster representing everything which threatens the English Imperial Order. Rather, he is the English Imperial Order. Part of the burgeoning upper middle class, a doctor and a white man. As Bryn Gelbert puts it, he is power incarnate. Perhaps this is no surprise, Video games often put the player in a position of power, and who wouldn't want to play as the vampire in a vampire game? You get all the cool perks like super speed, super strength, and irresistible charm. But Vampire isn't putting you in this position to take that power for granted, it challenges you to question it. If Jonathan himself is power incarnate, then where are the marginalised in Vampire? As we roam the streets of London, we encounter many of them, some as humans and some as monsters. For a standalone game, Vampire offers rich lore. The vampire isn't a lone figure, as he is in Dracula, but part of a hidden, complex social order which mirrors, in some respects, that of the human world. In this social hierarchy, skulls are the lowest of the low. These are our visible, ugly monsters, described using racial tropes of barbarism and savagery. One in-game document tells you that skull means slave, so from all this their racialization is clear. But the so-called deformity of the skulls, as well as their so-called madness, inscribes them as disabled too. Their condition is highly contagious and seems not to spread through traditional vampiric means, that is, drinking the blood of one sire, but through infection. In this way, perhaps these are the monsters which are a receptacle for all that is other in Vampire, but they are not unsympathetic. In Act 1, you spend most of your time in the poorer districts of Whitechapel, the East End Docks, and the stretched, thin Pembroke Hospital, where folks are fighting a losing war against the Spanish flu epidemic. You hear people's stories of strife and learn that the Spanish flu is, in fact, a vampire epidemic, specifically a skull epidemic. Just to be clear, the game is taking some liberties with history, unless you know something that I don't. I'll quickly note here that an epidemic is localised to one area while a pandemic spreads across multiple areas. The designation Spanish Flu, which was used in 1919, was also deployed in a xenophobic manner to blame the Spanish for originating the flu. Kind of like the way folks were being hella xenophobic recently and blaming China for Covid. With this in mind, the Spanish flu is often now referred to as the influenza pandemic of 1919 instead, both to remove the xenophobic connotations and to accurately describe a virus which swept across multiple nations, rather than implying that it was localised to Spain. In the interest of using the language that Vampire uses, and to be clear that I am talking about the vampire virus that we're dealing with in the game rather than the historical reality of the 1919 influenza pandemic, I'll continue to use the designation Spanish flu epidemic. In the interest of scientific accuracy, it's worth pointing out that the use of epidemic in the game actually does end up being accurate in this case, because Jonathan constantly expresses that we aren't dealing with the same virus as the one on the continent. Rather, we're dealing with a skull virus which is localised to London only. In any case, as the game progresses, you also learn that the poorer districts of the city are more exposed to this virus. Our disabled, racialized monsters are mostly working-class monsters, too. This becomes apparent when we discover that the sad saint of the East End, Sean Hampton, has been helping not only the human poor he houses in his night asylum, but the poor sewer skulls, a literal underclass living in the sewers. Skulls feed on corpses, not blood as Ekons do, so skulls aren't blood suckers or parasites. 
In fact, if they desire blood at all, it isn't human, but Ekon. Ekon being the name that this universe gives to higher vampires that more resemble our cultural idea of a vampire. Perhaps Skulls are the spectre of communism, then, the latent threat of class revolution that haunts their rulers? Unfortunately, when a Skull sees us in the street, they are so mad and so savage that we can't reason with them. They make up a significant amount of the enemy NPCs we kill. This creates a strange dissonance which remains unresolved when playing Vampire. The narrative goes to great lengths to create sympathy for Skulls, but the gameplay perhaps doesn't allow you much room to demonstrate that empathy. Worse, it seems to create a divide between good Skulls and bad Skulls. Those Skulls who speak, think, and feel, and those that are mindless animals. Emphasis on dialogue and choice mechanics characterise your interaction with the good, human-like Skulls. Meanwhile, combat mechanics characterise your interactions with the bad Skulls. The lesser vampires among lesser vampires, it seems. Interestingly, this brings to mind Don't Nod's debut title, Remember Me, in which the majority of enemy NPCs are so-called Leapers, people who have mutated and live in the sewers of Neo Paris as a result of absorbing too many memories. Leapers are spatially represented as an underclass living beneath a large city, like Skulls. They are addicts, addicted to memory technology which allows them to remove unpleasant memories and absorb pleasant ones, making them a class of disabled people using technology to self-medicate too. Vampire perhaps gives more depth to Skulls than Remember Me affords to Leapers, but there's another important similarity. We're encouraged to feel sympathy for Leapers, largely through context clues like graffiti expressing their pain, but we never stop fighting them. Perhaps these games don't go as far as they could, but they both seem interested in complicating your relationship to enemy NPCs. In Vampire, Skulls are the inferior vampires, but you, Dr. Jonathan Reed, are no Skull. You are an Ekon, one of the superior beings that lives in the West End, lives in a mansion, and belongs to Ascalon, a boys' club committed to upholding and serving the British Empire. The name Ascalon refers to the weapon used by St. George to slay the dragon, an English legend if ever there was one. Skulls are created by contagion, but Lady Ashbury tells us that Ekons are a rare breed, whose offspring are almost never accidental. The ghost of eugenics is upon us, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Though we aren't given much more to go on, Volkods are also worth a mention. This is a species of vampire which is giant, dark-skinned, and described as radiating violence. These are the so-called Hounds of Ascalon, animalistic slaves to creatures of pure blood and apparently… Irish? Volkods seem to be an enslaved, colonised, and racialized class, then. Alright. As the story of Vampire unfolds, we learn that the Pillar of the West End District, corporate overlord Aloysius Dawson, plans to build a wall to divide the West End from the rest of London. This will protect the rich from the virus and leave the poor to die, in theory. Jonathan explains why this method is scientifically unsound. This feels contemporaneous considering the game was released in 2018, with Trump's well-known campaign to build a wall between the US and Mexico looming over the popular consciousness. His intention, of course, to keep Mexicans out of America, configuring them as disease-ridden vampiric leeches that prey upon Americans. As I'll discuss later, this stark visual metaphor of a wall segregating London, protecting the rich and leaving the poor to die, anticipates Covid policies in the UK. After Skulls, a few Volkods and the occasional Ekon, we've got vampire hunters making up the vast portion of enemy NPCs in this game. The Guard of Prewen is a militia, patrolling the streets of London to keep them free from the vampire threat. Nurse Pippa of the Pembroke Hospital wants to join Prewen. She feels the fight isn't in the hospital, but in the streets. Pippa's dilemma creates a dichotomy of thinking about vampires, but particularly Skulls, who are the majority. On one hand, as monsters to be vanquished, invoking the 19th century gothic tradition we discussed earlier, and on the other hand, as disabled people to be cared for. The Pembroke Hospital is consistently depicted via war imagery linking it to World War I. Nurses and doctors stand bravely at the front line, fighting an invisible enemy. 
This is historically relevant to the way that men and women were targeted as soldiers, nurses, and ambulance drivers as part of the war effort during this period, but it also feels relevant to recent times. In the UK, the pandemic has been inflected with the rhetoric of war, for example, the normalisation of the term frontline workers. They're imagined as nationalistically serving their country and doing their duty, and as it's their duty, they surely shouldn't be asking for higher pay, better working conditions, or a comfortably funded health system. I'm going to unpack later why the idea of healthcare workers as soldiers is significant, but for now let's dwell on Pippa's choice, to fight on the streets with guns, or to fight in the hospital with medicine. If the patients at the hospital are the literal human poor and disabled, and scowls are a vampire metaphor for the poor and disabled, though the two groups are not mutually exclusive, Pippa's first choice characterises the human working class mad and sick as not only worth saving, but capable of saving at all. The second choice, meanwhile, characterises skulls as beastly and irredeemable. In fact, perhaps this is the inevitable fate of the human underclass, many of whom will become skulls as you as the player choose to neglect or actively harm them. It's in their nature. The skulls are the hides to their human jackals. As you might be thinking already, the parallel between oppressed human beings and skulls doesn't map perfectly. It creates a lot of tension and ambivalence, and it raises a lot of questions. But for one, it brings to mind the possible distinction between good and bad skulls discussed earlier. For Pippa, perhaps humans are the good poor and disabled, and skulls are the bad poor and disabled. Would she care for skulls as she cares for humans? Would she kill humans as she kills skulls? It's uncertain. Pippa and her boyfriend Milton are pessimistic about the underfunding and under-resourcing of the hospital as well as their own poverty. Before Pippa even considers joining Prewin, it leads them to exploit people, secretly charging for hospital beds and selling weapons. Poverty and the different reactions it can evoke, towards pessimism and selfishness, or towards solidarity and compassion, is a big theme in this game. Not only here, but for example when we contrast the exploitative Wet Boot Boys gang with its rival faction, the Dockers Trade Union. If you kill Milton, Pippa leaps from the precipice of that pessimism. The next night she goes missing from the Pembroke, and if you find her on Whitechapel Street, it turns out she's given up on healing. She becomes a new recruit for the Guard of Prewen, and soon after, you kill her. Considering how skulls are characterised, Prewin begins to resemble a white supremacist militia defending the worthy by taking up arms against the other. That Prewin will kill Ekons and target them in the second act of the game is really only by the by, because the Ekons aren't on the streets, they're in the shadows. Characters like Tom and Archer tell us that Prewin are thugs in uniform, a gang preying on the vulnerable, and this is corroborated by a discovery that Prewin robbed the Dockers trade union to fund their militant activities. Manipulating and recruiting the working class, but clearly not acting in their interests. Sounds like military. Now, if there are sympathetic monsters in Vampyr, then there are monstrous humans too. Cadogan Bates, for example, literalises what the metaphoric Ascalon Club represents, a racist landlord who leeches off poor Romanian migrants living in Whitechapel, a vampire of the highest degree. Meanwhile, Seymour Fishburne offers a real-life parallel to our traditional idea of the vampire as a creature with murderous urges that cannot be contained, giving us the opportunity to break this idea apart. Seymour is a serial killer who simply cannot seem to contain his murderous urges, just as Jonathan struggles with his thirst for blood. The idea of killers having urges has been around for a while, and it pathologizes violence, giving it an easy way out. It's rooted in the idea, as Foucault argues in Discipline and Punish, and as we discuss in our video on Justice in Games, that some people are simply born with innate natural urges to kill, urges we can't control. This decontextualizes and depoliticizes violence. But violence always has a reason, or more accurately, reasons, some of which are always sociopolitical. It's interesting that this understanding of murder as a pathological instinct is something that persists, when it would unravel if we compared it to sexual violence. It's becoming more accepted that the idea of uncontrollable urges being used to justify sexual violence, particularly against women, is a convenient excuse for patriarchy. Sexual violence is about power, not urges. Similar, I argue, as does Foucault, 
for murder. Vampire's lore offers a highly political context for vampires. Ekons are vampires in the Marxist sense, while Skals are parasites in the racist, classist, disabledist sense. But the pathology of evil persists somehow. In fact, our noble vampires, Jonathan, Lady Ashbury, and William Marshall, are creatures who desire to do good and fight their innate urge to drink blood. We're meant to sympathise with them and admire their mental and spiritual strengths for this reason. But perhaps undermining its own logic again, Vampire uses its game mechanics to tempt us to kill. Ultimately, whether we do kill is a choice, whatever our reasons for wanting to. Urges, it would seem, can be controlled. As it turns out, the Skal epidemic was created by vampire elders. Our noble Jonathan was turned into a vampire by a creature that, as he himself puts it, is blood. Murden Wilde, servant of the Red Queen Morrigan. The virus is the blood of hate. It comes in cycles throughout history and leads to disasters, one of which caused the Great Fire of London. Again, not the version of 1666 we learned in school, but our teachers may well have been keeping secrets. Now, if you're Welsh or familiar with Celtic belief, or gay because you watched BBC's Merlin, I know your ears must be perking up at the mention of Merdin, who would become the Merlin of Arthurian legend, and Morrigan. If blood is at the centre of the vampire myth, it's also at the core of the myth of nobility, and continues into our capitalist age. Bloodlines who have the divine right to power, who now pass it on from Nepo baby to Nepo baby. Bodies that are disposable, whose blood we spill, or drink. Is Vampire trying to tell us that its own highly political vampire world is about the violence of human nature? Or more coherently, that human systems have taken different violent forms throughout history and capitalism is just the latest one? The Morrigan wants to cleanse us, to teach us humility. Her hatred and her anger are carried through I-Cores that are always female, and Murden always balances out by choosing a man, from King Arthur to Dr. Jonathan Reed, as his champion. His champion to smite the i and halt the Red Queen's female rage apocalypse in its tracks. Perhaps this is about how patriarchy has spawned from age to age, and woman's wrath always rises to meet it before it's silenced. A modern answer to an ancient threat is what Murden seeks in our good doctor. A fatalistic view of a world doomed to cycles of violence that can never be broken. But what do you expect from a weird little immaterial horned guy that speaks in riddles? Vampire is full of contradictions, but as Julie Muncy snappily puts it, its messiness doesn't weaken its bite. It wants us thinking and questioning, and it's exciting and interesting in what it's trying to do. From all we've discussed so far, one thing's for sure though, Don't Nod's monsters are political beasts. Vampire is a game, so it isn't enough to think of the vampire as image with regards to character and plot. What do vampires, and what do you as the player, do in this game? Power isn't just a question of individual bodies, it's about how bodies interact. Power is inherently relational, it's about how bodies relate to one another. Now, video games are very viscerally about how bodies interact, but you aren't just reading or observing them interact like when you read a book or watch a movie. You're playing a direct role in shaping how they interact, within the limits, of course, of the script that is game design. How you as the player manage bodies and interact with bodies, like many games, is a key aspect of Vampire. Foucault, come on, another chug of your monster energy drink, coined the term biopower in his book History of Sexuality, Volume 1, to describe a kind of power that works by administering life and bodies. The word administer is key here, we're thinking about bureaucratic processes which manage life. For example, immigration documentation and border control are an exercise in biopower. This, to some folks, seemingly innocuous, painfully boring bureaucratic process meticulously documents life in order to control it. Those of us who do have immigration documentation are marked for life, for access to housing, employment, and relative freedom of movement. Those who don't have immigration documentation, who are held in detention centres or indefinitely awaiting asylum, are marked for poverty, violence, discrimination, and death. 
Directly related to biopower is an unfortunately probably much more familiar term, eugenics. The Cambridge Dictionary defines eugenics as the idea that it is possible to improve humans by allowing only particular people to produce children. You might already see how this links to ideas about degeneration I talked about earlier. If sexual deviance, racial others, and disabled people indicate that we are degenerating as a species, then eugenics is about stopping these people from breeding, while encouraging good, moral, read, white, cis-heterosexual, non-disabled people to breed. The Cambridge Dictionary also insists, with no evidence to support the point, that most people now do not accept or support eugenics because of the idea's connection with racist and Nazi theories and actions. The idea that eugenics is no longer supported or relevant is something that I'm about to argue against. I'm about to argue that, in fact, it's pretty chillingly normalised. So biopower is a way of exercising power, a structure and a practice of power, which is underpinned by a philosophy of eugenics. Through the careful administration of bodies, through the creation of policies and procedures, we weed out the lesser humans and protect the superior ones. Now, before moving on to Vampyr, I want to unpack the biopower and eugenics we've seen at play over the last three years since the COVID pandemic began. About a year into the pandemic here in the UK, the Trade Union Congress Disabled Workers Conference claimed that the shadow of eugenics was hanging over the country's response. Government policies, as well as the actions of doctors, exposed how entrenched the discrimination and abuse of disabled people in our society is. These government policies were based on the idea of pursuing herd immunity. Countries like China and South Korea successfully employed suppression measures in response to the virus. Measures like mass testing, isolation, quarantine, lockdown, medical follow-ups, etc. Drastically halting the spread and reducing deaths. But these measures cost time and money, which some governments weren't willing to spend. The cost of lives is negligible compared to economic costs, right? So herd immunity was pushed, ignoring hard evidence about the importance of suppression measures for saving lives. Herd immunity follows the logic that we can't suppress the virus, only slow it down. So we should just let it do its thing. Running amok, ruining health, taking lives, until those that survive develop immunity. This is obviously bullshit. Vito Laterza and Louis-Philippe Romer argue that even if the herd immunity approach were scientifically sound, the rhetoric which supports this public health policy promotes the idea that it's acceptable to cull the elderly and disabled if the economy can be saved. As they put it, it is hard not to read eugenic implications in this kind of thinking. The herd will survive, but for that to happen, other, weaker members of society need to be sacrificed. Their discussion of Norway and Sweden illustrates the connection between biopower and eugenics well. The Norwegian and Swedish states have a long history of adopting policies based on eugenics that continued well after World War II. Eugenics was deployed throughout the 20th century as a branch of scientific state management, part of a social engineering project that envisioned a society made of physically healthy and socially fit individuals. Here, it's clear that state management and social engineering is the management of life. Its method is biopower and its logic is eugenics. Importantly, these policies and practices, this philosophy, is serving the market. It's protecting capital at the expense of life. But whose lives are being saved and whose lives are disposable? Public health messaging has clearly targeted a healthy population, creating an other to be sacrificed. Disabled people make part of this other, those whose deaths are acceptable to preserve the integrity of the herd. The Office for National Statistics showed that 6 in 10 COVID-related deaths were those of disabled people. In fact, doctors were illegally placing DNR, or do not resuscitate, orders on neurodivergent and disabled patients without discussing it with them or their loved ones. Among the disposable other also is the working class. The Office for National Statistics showed that workers in low-paid jobs were more likely to die from the virus with high-risk occupations, including bus drivers, service workers, and care workers. Nor is it a coincidence that racialized people have been disproportionately affected and have disproportionately died as a result of the virus. In May 2020, research by Lucinda Platt and Ross Warwick for the Institute for Fiscal Studies showed that ethnic minorities, primarily racialized ones, were more likely to be hospitalized or die from the virus. For example, Bangladeshi hospital fatalities were twice those of the British group. 
Pakistani deaths 2.9 times as high, and black African deaths 3.7 times as high. And these numbers don't account for deaths that, for whatever reason, are not officially attributed to the virus, for example, deaths that didn't occur in hospitals. This report traces many factors which mainly boil down to the fact that racialized people are more likely to be economically vulnerable and more likely to have poor health as a result of racial capitalism and medical racism. They're more likely to be key workers in low-paid service jobs where there's a higher risk of occupational exposure, they're more likely to have underlying health conditions, they're more likely to live in urban centers, and so on. And racist narratives were at the center of the pandemic too, particularly xenophobic narratives about infectious Chinese people originating and spreading the virus. In London, a year and a half into the pandemic in September 2021, recorded hate crimes against Asians had increased by almost 180% during the pandemic, according to the Evening Standard. Two years later, according to research by the Nuffield Trust published in November 2022, class and racial inequalities in terms of COVID-related impact is as stark as ever. They point out that economic deprivation has been a key factor in COVID-related deaths, and racialized people are more likely to be economically deprived. It isn't stated in this report, but so are disabled people who are more likely to struggle accessing employment, welfare, and support. The report looks at London specifically, which is relevant for our purposes, showing that London experienced the largest regional level fall in life expectancy at birth in England, with life expectancy and mortality rates far higher for poor Black and Asian Londoners. For example, during the first wave, Black Londoners faced a 2.5 to 3 times higher risk of dying than White Londoners, and South Asian Londoners around twice the risk. Undocumented migrants, those without access to public funds, unable to access furlough payments or sick pay, those who are houseless, those who are disabled, all had higher mortality rates as well. Once the vaccine rolled out, these groups were also less likely to have access to it for a complex range of reasons. Now, before we turn back to Vampire with all of this in mind, I want to highlight a quote from this report. London experiences the highest level of individual level income inequality in England, with its richest and poorest residents also tending to be clustered in separate, segregated areas or enclaves, creating significant spatial inequalities across the capital, as well as inequalities between individuals. The consequence of that during the first and second waves of the pandemic was a stark reflection of the national trend, showing a COVID-related death rate more than twice as high for those living in the most deprived tenth of London's neighbourhoods than for those living in the least deprived tenth. What I want to draw attention to here is how London is a city which is clearly segregated according to class, race and disability. The social, political and economic inequality in this city is reflected in how the space is physically experienced. Anyone who's been to London probably knows what I mean. You feel the segregation starkly from one borough to the next. In Vampire, you certainly experience the city of London as fragmented and segregated along class and racial lines. There are four main districts of London you can access in this game, the Pembroke Hospital, Whitechapel, and the Docks, all in East London, and finally, the West End. If you know much about London, you probably know that the East End is historically associated with poor racialized groups. Strikingly for our vampiric history, this includes Jewish and Romanian migrants, you can check out our reading list in the description for more on that from the London Jewish Museum. These groups, categorised as other white ethnicities, also faced more fatalities from the Covid pandemic than white British people, according to research I cited earlier. The West End, meanwhile, is the luxurious, pristine side of the city, rich and, of course, white. On your citizen menu screen in Vampire, you can see that each district has a community pillar at the centre. Surrounding them are various community members, some of whom are isolated, others that have a social circle of one or two other people. The pillar, of course, is connected to everyone. The idea is, if you kill someone who's connected to others, there will be consequences which unfold over the next nights. Like when I mentioned earlier, that if you kill Milton, Pippa joins the Guard of Prewin. If you kill someone isolated, there are little to no consequences except a fall in the overall health of the district. 
if you kill anyone at all, the district's overall health will decrease, and if it gets low enough, the district will descend into chaos. District health impacts the economy, meaning your in-game shops might buy for higher prices and sell for lower. To boot, individual citizens can get sick, and getting sick decreases the amount of XP you get from killing them. The sicker they are, the less XP. All of this means your motives for keeping a district healthy might be about getting that juicy, XP-rich victim later down the line, or it might be about getting bargains when you're out shopping. The value of life is inscribed in XP and in money, but also in the level required to mesmerize someone. Early in the game, you can only mesmerize those with apparently weaker minds. You can snack on these early, or you can save your appetite for stronger minds and richer meat later on. Clearly, there are a few things to unpack here. First, the total XP attached to a citizen if you kill them is almost always attached to their social value, and this social value is inscribed in a few ways, depending on whether you're in the poorer or richer districts. The obvious one is whether someone has social connections, which is not insignificant. For example, apparently no one will miss the depressed, drunk, and homeless Dyson Delaney once he's dead. Similarly, madwoman Karina Billo wanders the West End with lower XP value than healthy, wealthy Calhoun Russell, even though he has no friends either. Assessing the value of life and deciding who's disposable and who isn't brings to mind the UK government COVID policies I talked about earlier, designed to preserve the economy and the interests of the wealthy at the expense of everyone else. More likely to be important in Vampire, depending on your approach to the game, are Jonathan's needs and desires for blood as well as your needs and desires as a player, for XP, money, or items. We sacrifice the lives of the majority, those who are easier and more strategic to kill, of those who will disappear without a trace and with no one to remember them, all for ourselves and for Jonathan to live and thrive. A little like choosing the fallacy of herd immunity and sacrificing the many to preserve the few, and even to profit from Covid deaths. The idea of this game mechanic, that the health of the district will decrease no matter who you kill though, is perhaps reductive. I found it jarring on one particular occasion. On one run of Vampire, which I lovingly called my Eat the Rich playthrough, the first person I killed was Cadigan Bates, the pretty much totally irredeemable landlord who is openly racist and systematically exploiting poor vulnerable Romanian migrants with extortionate rents. The night after I killed Cadigan, the district's health fell, but I couldn't help thinking, isn't that too simple? Arguably, couldn't the district's health increase on account of removing a major barrier to housing for the people of Whitechapel? Call it vigilante justice, if you will. Did somebody say justice? I wonder how much worse off London would be without Boris Johnson, though his individual loss wouldn't change the system if someone just rose to take his place. This aspect of Vampire's morality mechanic feels a little black and white. It amounts to the idea that killing is always bad and letting live is always good. This is enshrined in the various endings you can get to this game. The best ending if you kill no one, a good ending if you kill only a few, a bad ending if you kill loads and loads of people, and a worst ending if you kill literally everyone. In fact, Jonathan's monstrosity, he is more monstrous the more he kills, no matter who he's killing, is made visible in his eyes, which grow darker the more you kill, and indicate in advance which ending you're likely to get. But there's an important difference between violence which perpetuates or results from systems of domination, and violence which one might use to defend oneself or resist these systems. In fact, there's at least one explicit mention of the idea of violence as a political tool in the game, when you find out that Dyson, in his anarchist organising days, blew up a munitions factory. Dyson disavowed violence as a political tool when he learned that he unknowingly killed Rufus's parents, making the boy homeless and orphaned. Poverty breeds violence, says Tom Watts, who tells us he was imprisoned for the attempted murder of a landlord. He just couldn't bring himself to do it. Revolutionary violence is perhaps too easily dismissed as morally wrong here, when there are those who would argue that there are times when it's necessary or justified. Speaking of district health, those from poorer districts talk extensively about their struggle to access healthcare. They never go to hospital, they certainly don't receive home visits, because they can't afford it, or they don't trust doctors. They're deeply sceptical of Jonathan as a result. 
Meanwhile, quite a few characters from the rich West End are personally familiar with Jonathan, his friends as well as his patients. When your citizen patient falls ill, for the poor folks who are hesitant or even flat out refuse to take medication, Jonathan can use his vampire mind powers to force them to take it. And of course, while you can keep these districts as healthy as possible out of the goodness of your heart, there are no particular rewards for that. As discussed, game mechanics incentivize you to medicate patients without their consent for more nefarious purposes. Healthier citizen patients make for more XP-rich meals. As someone who's personally become highly skeptical of doctors after many experiences of medical gaslighting and gatekeeping, this hit home. I've even found it difficult to bring myself to see a doctor when I've been struggling with possible symptoms of long COVID, because the very idea of putting myself through a painfully bureaucratic system just to be told I'm fine when I'm not, wears me out. And in the UK, healthcare is becoming increasingly privatised in pursuit of a US style system, so I, like many others, think twice about the cost before seeing a doctor or taking medication. Our health system is overstretched and underfunded, and medical practitioners are overworked and in some cases underpaid. But while we advocate for universal free healthcare, we must avoid the pitfall of valorizing doctors. In truth, while it's normalized to lord doctors as saviors, they have power over us. They control our access to medicine, medical procedures and therapies, and medical knowledge. In the age of the internet, many patients are choosing to inform themselves about their own care to gain medical knowledge of their own. And of course, there's the lived experience of living in one's own body, all more often than not systematically ignored by doctors. They can and often do prevent us from having autonomy in our own care in this way. And most damningly, they can quite literally choose to take our freedom by institutionalizing us with the flick of a pen on a document or a quick call to the police. Jonathan's vampire manipulation powers are often used in the context of medical gatekeeping, gaslighting, and manipulation. In fact, Seymour Fishburne, the serial killer, observes that Jonathan's being a doctor is a convenient way to gain people's trust, because the idea of doctors as good and as saviours is so normalised. Suddenly, his waxing poetic about the Hippocratic Oath and the duty of doctors to do no harm tastes sour. This isn't a simple, black and white, internal battle between good, doctors, and evil, vampires. Like Nicolas Cage's vampire executive, like vampires versus the Bronx's vampire real estate agents, like Marx's vampire capitalists, we're challenged to think that perhaps doctors are vampire-like. They have power, which they gain at the expense of the vulnerable. I talked a bit about Vampyr's attitude towards the morality of violence before. All violence is bad, no nuance. And this feels deeply connected to doctors and our concept of morality as regards doctors. We're taught to regard doctors as moral paragons rather than to think politically of them, as agents of systems of violence and power, as well as the distribution of care. So perhaps Vampyr's morality can be thought of in dialogue with the Hippocratic Oath, if we take it for granted as a moral compass. If you get worse and worse endings depending on how many people you kill, then morality is arguably measured against the oath. Do no harm at all and you'll be amply rewarded. Do a little harm is a treat, and if you just make sure it's just those low value citizens rather than the high value ones that can collapse a district, you don't have to worry. But the more harm you do, the worse your punishment will be. But is it possible, as this system might imply with its best possible ending, to commit no harm at all as a doctor? Is murder the only harm? Is it not harm when a doctor chooses not to believe your pain? What about when he blames your health issues on your weight, refusing to look into other causes, or even prescribing weight loss and recommending unhealthy ways to achieve it? When you're on the wrong medicine, or too tired and too afraid to ask for help, is he not killing you slowly? The tie between violence and the power that doctors have, as I have argued, is inevitable under our system, but perhaps it can be for an individual doctor to choose to wield this power or to relinquish it, and perhaps, though only to some degree, it's in our hands as the player to make those choices too. Medical ethics, access to healthcare, and politics generally are all striking themes, especially in the early part of Vampyr. Romanian migrant Christina Popa is excluded from other employment due to her immigration status, so she does sex work. 
Poor Whitechapel born and raised Joe Peterson is excluded from other employment due to his criminal record, so he keeps working for the Wet Boot Boys gang in order to support his disabled son. Talk about biopower. Former trade unionist Giselle Paxton and anarchist Dyson Delaney self-medicate their mental distress with alcohol because they can't access healthcare, housing, or employment. Giselle distrusts Jonathan not just because he's a doctor, but because, as she says, he's an enemy of the working class. Go off, queen. And the class position of doctors should be emphasised, as it furthers the point that doctors have power. The doctor-patient relationship in the game is inflected with distrust, manipulation, and power. Jonathan is only able to become a doctor because his father was a rich banker. He's able to move freely across the city because he's a doctor, while most of London's residents are restricted to their districts, segregated by quarantine barriers, suffering or exploiting unequal wealth distribution. And this freedom of movement that Jonathan has in contrast to those confined to their homes are wandering the ghostly streets of London in the dead of night with little choice but to expose themselves to disease or violence feels reminiscent of something close to home. Like the esteemed Dr. Jonathan Reed, the UK government lives by a different set of rules to the rest of us. In 2020, conservative politicians were breaking lockdown rules, having parties, refusing to wear masks or keep distance, while everyone else was stuck inside or forced to work in hospitals or supermarkets to keep as many of us alive and supplied with food and medicine as possible. And if we're going to explore the vampire society hierarchy as a dark mirror of our human class system, while Ekons can turn humans into skulls, usually the result of an attempt to create another Ekon gone wrong, they are impervious to becoming skulls themselves, which is to say they aren't affected by the skull epidemic in the same way that everyone else is. The Ascalon Club as the representative of Ekons only really become interested in ending the epidemic in Act 2, when the Guard of Prewen launches a great hunt and pledges to kill every vampire in London. So, the vampire 0.01% are not affected by the epidemic in the same way as the majority of people, and our real-life vampire-like 0.01% aren't affected by Covid like everyone else is. The reasons include easy access to healthcare, including pre-Covid, which resulted in overall better health, and financial security, no need to work in low-paying, insecure or unsafe jobs that require contact and put one at risk of contracting and spreading Covid. A major plot point in Vampire is the reveal that the cause of the scowl epidemic is Dr. Edgar Swansea's medical malpractice. A member of the Brotherhood of St. Paul stole, and almost fetishistically interested in vampires, Dr. Edgar Swansea has a friendship with Lady Ashbury, and an agreement. She is the Pembroke Hospital's biggest donor, and in exchange, Swansea turns the other way when she feeds on the blood of the dying, read Poor and Disabled. As administrator of the Pembroke, he simply administrates these deaths away. Again, talk about biopower. Turns out, without Lady Ashbury's consent, Swansea uses her blood in an experimental attempt to cure his patient Harriet Jones, turning Harriet into the generator of the virus. Indeed, he did not have Harriet's consent to do that either. Lady Ashbury, as the vampiric daughter of the knight William Marshall and the healthy carrier of his poisoned blood, is the actual generator of the virus. That William Marshall's blood indirectly causes the scale epidemic is interesting. The blood of hate, carried through aristocratic English blood of mythical stature, infects and creates the very poor, disabled and racialized masses it oppresses in order to exist. And yet this threatens a disaster, an apocalyptic event. Capitalism, preceded by feudalism, sows the seeds of its own destruction? But at what cost, and who is liberated? Let's look at an alternative model of healthcare and community which appears in the game itself. Early in Vampire, Lady Ashbury is being extorted by someone who knows that she is drinking the blood of dying patients at the Pembroke Hospital, and the Lady asks us, her ally in class, race, and vampirism of course, to weed the culprit out. As it turns out, the culprit is communist icon Dorothy Crane, or Dorothea Krasinescu. A Romanian migrant herself, Dorothea is dedicated not only to helping her fellow Romanians who are living in poverty, but everyone in Whitechapel. This is a hugely sympathetic upgrade, clearly, from Bram Stoker's xenophobic portrayal of Transylvanian Dracula leeching off the English. After working her day job as a nurse at the Pembroke Hospital, Dorothea extorts Lady Ashbury for money to distribute free healthcare to the citizens of Whitechapel who are suffering from the Spanish flu. At the game's first major decision point, you must choose to 
kill her, use your vampire powers to manipulate her into ending the blackmail and shutting the dispensary down, which results in her mind being irreparably affected and her turning into a scowl, or to spare her life, asking her to resign from the Pembroke and agreeing to fund her dispensary in exchange for medical equipment. This basically opens up a shop function in-game. Of course, Jonathan has power over Dorothea. She's a woman, a migrant, a nurse, and a human, so this doesn't really feel like a relationship between comrades. None of this is to argue that medical practitioners are evil. To start, they're not all the same. There is, of course, a power dynamic between doctors and nurses, not just between medical practitioners and patients. The doctor-nurse relationship to this day is a starkly gendered and racialized one. Even as women and racialized people are able to become doctors, it's often only those of a certain class position. In 1919, this was especially true, as women were not able to become doctors at all. This is emphasised in Vampyr through the plot of Nurse Brannigan being more competent than Dr. Tippett's and taking over his role in all but name, and presumably pay grade, if you kill him. While Jonathan dangles his power over Dorothea, Tippett's is insistent that he sees Brannigan as his equal, as knowledgeable and as skilled, if not more so. And well-meaning Dr. Tippett's is a victim of medical exhaustion himself. Overworked by the work of care in the face of an epidemic, Tippett self-medicates in order to work long hours, and he's so burnt out that he accidentally kills a patient by administrating the incorrect dose of anaesthetic. Medical practitioners are human at the end of the day, and they often have good intentions, but the issue at stake here is the political structure of medical systems. The same way you'd observe that white people are all complex and incredibly human, and at the same time have power over racialized people. No amount of individual goodwill will erase that fact. One must actively renounce that power and work to change the system that creates this power relation. The way our medical system is structured, ultimately, is on the basis of biopower, administrating life and death over the worthy and unworthy. Medical practitioners become arbiters of power in this context, but Dorothea Krasinescu and her dispensary show us that there's another way of being, another way of structuring care. She offers free, universal healthcare to the poor, to migrants, to those left on the margins. She attempts to undermine biopower and to save those that it has marked for death. Perhaps a Dorothy Crane or two would have saved many at the height of the pandemic, and would continue to help them now. Perhaps an entire system modelled on her principles would have saved hundreds of thousands from those deaths. But Dorothy Crane is no superhero, no saviour. Her work is impossible without her comrades. Darius Petrescu, who runs her printing press, or Camellia, who clandestinely distributes her leaflets. And without funding and resources, there's only so much these Whitechapel revolutionaries can do. It should give us hope that during the earlier days of Covid, you know, before the UK government decided that the pandemic was over, so many folks took it upon themselves to support one another. Our government had left us behind, but mutual aid groups were formed. Groups to share information and resources during times of need. Those who were able to leave their houses would deliver food and supplies to those with Covid or at risk. Communities would raise money to help folks struggling with food and housing costs, maybe because they'd been furloughed or lost their jobs. Those with extra medication would share it with those in need, and so on. These are things we can and should continue to do, as well as pushing for institutional change. Like Dorothea and her Whitechapel comrades, we damn well won't give up. In this essay, I've argued that monsters are always political, and the vampire metaphor can be deployed in ways that perpetuate othering, as is its historical president, or it can be toyed with to explore issues of power. This is probably inevitable because the blood-sucking parasitic leech at the core of the vampire's nature means that it's an image which invokes the idea of one who gains the supernatural power to cheat death by stealing the life of others. This narrative inflects racist, classist, disabledist, queerphobic tropes about parasitic others, but it can also be deployed to critique those who actually have power in our society. I've unpacked the way that your vampiric avatar, Dr. Jonathan Reed, can be read as power incarnate, but specifically I've wanted to explore the idea of the vampire doctor, and how this shows us the power relations baked into our medical system. 
In our medical system, the doctor always has power over us. Power he gains by manipulating us, by preventing us from having autonomy over our own care. Literally exercising power over our health, our lives, and our deaths. As the player, you're encouraged to exercise such biopower. You don't have medical records and documentations to hand, but you have a citizen menu which allows you to administrate the lives of Londoners to your whims. This fits thematically well with a lot of the game's threads about the politically segregated nature of London and of vampire society itself, with working class Londoners and Skulls serving the vast majority affected by the vampiric Spanish flu virus. Skulls are of a decidedly different nature to the blood-sucking Ekon. They are the other, they are to be killed in droves to grind through the game, but they are also to be pitied. With all of this in mind, Vampyr can encourage us to reflect not only on our own unequal healthcare system at large, but on the devastating effects of the pandemic over the last three years on poor, racialized, and disabled people. For a truly equal healthcare system, we must indeed think of fundamentally, economically, and politically restructuring our society for universal healthcare, housing, freedom of movement, the abolition of capitalism, an end to war, and so on. But there is a majorly overlooked aspect to left-wing arguments to this effect. That is, that doctors and nurses are valorized as selfless healers while ignoring that in the current system that they are arbiters of power, administering the power of life and death over us. Truly liberated healthcare means medical practitioners relinquishing power and promoting the autonomy of patients. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. If you enjoyed it, please do give it a like and be sure to comment. As always, a huge thank you to our patrons who make videos like this possible. We genuinely couldn't do it without you. If you aren't a patron already, please consider supporting us over at patreon.com slash gamersysyt. Catch us over on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook for further discussions and conversations. And as always, thank you for watching. Take care.